You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia, coming to you from London. I'm Tim Walklate, and today I'm taking a look back at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi. Two weeks of superhuman competition saw athletes sliding, skating and skiing their way to honours in the Caucasus. By the end of the Games, host nation Russia topped the medal table with 13 gold, 11 silver and 9 bronze, while Great Britain equalled their best Winter Olympics with four medals, one gold, one silver and two bronze. As he officially closed Sochi 2014, the president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, said that Russia and the Black Sea Resort had delivered all that it promised. But what about Team GB? Although the Brits exceeded their target of three medals, is it enough to justify the longer-term investment in winter sports? Joining me in the studio to discuss this is Mihir Bose, a sports writer and award-winning journalist, Jonathan Wilson, a sports journalist and author of five books, and John Goodbody, who covers the Olympics for the Sunday Times. Thank you all for joining me. Me here, you were there. What was it like? Well, it was the most unusual experience I've had of all the games I've been to, that you had two artificial cities which were created. In effect, it was a, a reality show of the American film Field of Dreams, If You Build, He'll Come. In this case, If We Build, They'll Come. The facilities were marvellous, particularly for the athletes. The games as such were very good, but it was unreal to go to a place where there was no local community of any kind. Normally, you go for sport, but you also want to meet what the locals are like. And we, all you met were Olympic volunteers, Olympic officials, a fellow journalists, but nobody local. So I, I don't quite know what the legacy is. And, and one legacy might be religious because there were three new churches that have been built which we could gaze out from the, from the main press centre. And I've never been to a game, Olympics or World Cup, where a religious legacy is part of the legacy of the Games. Obviously, mildly successful for Team GB as well. Four medals uh, won over the course of the 17 days. John, would you say it was a success? Yes, I mean, from the British point of view, it was as almost as much as one have, could have hoped for to get four medals. The interesting thing is that uh, it was, in fact, our best ever performance in the number of medals. Because in 1924, when we won the curling, no medals were awarded because uh, it was just a demonstration sport. But um, the UK Sport, the agency that distributes money in, in Britain towards Olympic sports, gave 14, nearly £14 million and hoping for somewhere between three and seven medals. And they got four and really, you know, that was as good as we could possibly have hoped for. Jonathan Wilson, would you agree with that? £14 million, pounds, four medals, is that, is that about right? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I have a slight underlying concern about the funding of, of sport that yeah, as somebody who loves sport I, you know, I kind of emotionally think yes it definitely should be funded at a time when public bodies are, are facing cutbacks all over I wonder how justifiable the amount of money spent on sport is but yeah, in, in terms of here's £40 million spent four medals is a result that, that equation seems entirely favourable to me Looking at £272 million spent on 19 summer sports summer sports that is Compared to £14 million, pounds, that's, a, that's a drop in the ocean, isn't it, here? Yeah, it's a drop in the ocean. But what, what is uh, interesting about Sochi is that the winter athletes have done what the summer athletes have been doing ever since Sydney, which is target certain sports like cycling, like rowing. I mean, you know, one accepts that Great Britain cannot, even at its best, compete with the really big nations of the of United States and so on. But they can in certain sports do. And, and what we've done with Sochi, in Sochi is in sports like skeleton and snowboarding, you know, Great Britain has shown that it can do quite well. Now, the question is of course this is lottery money lottery money has changed everything and we raise and jonathan is right to raise the larger question do we actually fund sport and what does sport do but one could argue that the winter olympics uh, given how enthusiastically they were received in this country i understand it probably um, has fed a feel-good factor more than wayne rooney's um, salary on a side note that i mean how is the funding broken down you say national lottery does it come from anywhere else no, it's just UK sport channels lottery money into the governing bodies. They collect a bit. The BOA has a bit of a, a, a raise. Essentially, it's lottery money that is funding. And that, just after Atlanta, has, has changed the landscape of British sport. And for the first time, it has changed the landscape of winter sports. 
So before Atlanta, it was simply a certain amount, amount of money invested in sprinting and, and so on and so forth. Is that right? Before Atlanta, there was no public money as such going in. It was what private money you could get. BOA would have a sort of fundraising thing. Individual governing bodies would try and get sport and individual athletes mainly. There were amateur athletes. They would have to find their own means. They would have to work somewhere, you know, get that sort of thing. So that is what has changed now, that now if you're performing up to a standard and, and and this is no medals, no money is the, is the UK sports slogan. If you're performing, then you are assured a certain sum of money, which is very important because also the money also helps the governing bodies to hire the best coaches so that they don't have to worry. that If they've got a good coach who's produced, say, four medals in a particular sport, he'll be targeted by some other country and taken away. They can pay them enough money to keep them here. Is it not all also counterproductive, though, John Goodbody? I think it was three million pounds, around three million pounds spent on bobsleigh this time round. Surely it's better to just invest an extra three million pounds on uh, on a good sprinter and uh, surely that's the gold medal for the summer games. Uh, not necessarily because you're not certain that you're going to get that gold medal in the sprinting. I think the three million on bobsleigh, I mean they came fifth, the uh, four man bob which was, they were close enough to justify it I think. So that uh, you know it has, has helped British sport enormously. What happened up until 1996 was that uh, there was an organisation called the Sports Aid Foundation which was a charity and that gave money to leading competitors uh, particularly in sports and that was set up in 1976 after our rather perfor- poor performance at the Montreal Olympics and that has helped for a long time. That still functions the Sports Aid Foundation but only at the grassroots of British sport but the, it was nothing like what um, has come in r- through both lottery money and also some exchequer funding since then and you know it has transformed British sport. But I think also I think it's three million pounds went to skeleton as well. Three point four million. Three point four million, thank you. <laughs> Surely winter sports are going to cost more to invest in rather than just a running track, isn't it? I mean it's the problem is this is not a winter sports country. So certain things like high altitude sport, you you know, you just can't hope to compete with the Scandinavians. And even in certain sports, the facilities are just not there. So the athletes will have to go abroad to compete. I mean, you know, one realises that. In that sense, you could say this is artificial construct. In summer sports, most of the facilities are here. And winter sports, you're really accepting that certain skating venues or, or bobsleigh, you know, events can't be properly held here. You've got to go abroad and, you know, skiing and so on. You certainly have to go abroad. Jonathan Wilson. Well, it, it seems to me there's a slight danger with this no medals, no money approach that there's a much more direct correlation between the money you put in in sports where you require a machine. So anything where you're, you're cycling, where you're in a, a bobsled, a skeleton, a rowing boat, a sailing boat, the technology to make that piece of equipment as efficient as possible, that's much more reliable. The, the correlation between the money you put in and the, the result you get out is, is much stronger than putting money into a sprinter who is a person and can break down or, or might not develop or, or whatever. But those machines, the finances are, you, are much more, you can rely on it. And therefore, are we in danger of directing too much money towards those machine-based sports? So you're saying almost somebody like myself could... Uh... <laughs> no, no, but, but I mean, certainly, why, why has there been this great boom in British cycling, for instance, in the last sort of 10 years or so? And it's, it's because they put in an, a huge amount of research into getting marginal gains with the helmet, with the suit, with the bike, with the wheels, with, with everything. The cycling really shows how that works. And, and brilliant coaching and brilliant athletes as well, of course. But the, the machine is a huge part of that. And I guess you can argue, does that matter? What is the point of funding sport, I guess, becomes then the question. And if it is to inspire other people to pick it up to kind of with health benefits to the country, if it is, as Mia suggested earlier, the, the sort of feel-good factor around the country... Then, then I guess any medal's a good medal. But the, the, the converse of that is, if you invested in football pitches, running tracks, ice rinks, is that going to get more people involved? Me here, both. Jonathan raises a very good point. But I think one should be careful. Olympics can be inspirational, but it doesn't mean it takes a person from being a couch potato to suddenly becoming a sprinter. For that, you need money invested at school sports level at a very, very early age. And this is now happening. The government is committed to £150 million every year for the next three years in school sports. But, Will, that won't happen. You won't get 
kids going on the bobsleigh down you know i mean i know that <laughs> I, I, I lived in nottingham for a while i know that there's a big sort of winter sports scene there I'm not sure if that's the case elsewhere across the uk no but you'll get kids participating not maybe in winter sports at least in summer sports and maybe some winter sports you look at the the champions you know you look at yarnold winning you look at jenny jones and maybe if you've got some facilities or some money coming in then maybe that will encourage but it'll take a period of time it won't happen overnight there's also there's a, a transferability, isn't there, that if you get involved in sport at an early age and you just develop sort of a, a sporting physique, I mean, we've seen... Um, like you, Jonathan. <laughs> that's very kind of here. I have been to the gym this morning. I didn't think you'd have noticed. But th- then, I mean, it, it, it happened with Lizzie Arnold, didn't you? Yeah, she, yeah. Did she watch the skeleton four years ago and said, right, I'm going to do that. She has a physique. She's a decent sprinter. And so by then working on a technique with the skeleton, she's able to take those sprinting skills and, and, and then become successful. And Lizzie Arnold went from a hep- heptathlete to her winter sport. So you can make that transition from a normal, if you like, summer sport to a slightly abnormal winter sport. Yeah, I mean, there's another example is Craig Pickering, who in fact competed in the 2008 Olympics as a sprinter, wanted to get into the sprinting for 2012 failed to do so he was injured so he thought i'm going to have a go at the 2014 winter olympics and had to pull out of the four-man bob and uh, that's another example to take bobsleigh as an example in britain the bobsleigh is done at bath there's no track at bath but they managed to reproduce similar circumstances in a situation to allow people to train there so that when they go abroad they've developed the athletic ability which they then have to hone on an actual track. Does that mean that possibly in future you could have athletes who who compete in both games and compete in a number of sports? Yes, and um, it has been done in the past when people have competed in both. But there are certain sports of which bobsleigh is one where you know, leading sprinters and athletes can make the adjustment very, very readily. I, I think funding doubled for Sochi mm. since Vancouver. For Pyeongchang in 2018, I know this is a completely ballpark figure, but how much do you reckon funding would likely be in, in, in four years' time? Well, at this point in time, that would be difficult to judge because they'll come back and they'll do a review and they'll check, you know, because all the governing bodies are expected to make a sort of prediction, a forecast. This is what we're going to aim for, how they have performed. And, and UK sport is pretty strict. If you haven't come up to your medal projections or your performance projections as well in the other championships, they can be severe. But at least I suppose that three or four sports that have done well, like um, a skeleton, curling and so on, uh, will have their funding increase, if anything. And some of the other sports which haven't done that well might have their funding decreased. Interesting, I saw that curling actually has less investment than both skeleton and bobsleigh. Is, is there any reason for that, John? I think it's partly because they can actually train at home in, cur- in curling, whereas the, you can't uh, with bobsleigh and skeleton. I think that's the reason. A lot of the cost for bobsleigh and uh, skeleton bob is the fact that people have to go abroad to actually compete and they have to keep competing abroad so I think that's the reason but curling is a good example I mean I was there in Salt Lake City in 2002 and Ronald Martin won and I suddenly became a a curling expert uh, (laughs) borrowing a lot of information from the Scottish journalist who would have got got a lot of money had he been you know had he licensed what he knew but in a sense then if you look at the men and the women okay they didn't probably do as well as they as they wanted to but nevertheless the sport is much more widely accepted widely known than what it was in 2002 when i think very few people in this country knew what a sport called curling was it's also uh, it's an institution as well in scotland certainly i mean maybe is it is it slightly different compared to the snowboarding and the skeleton it's an institution it's something that's gone on for i think 125 years in 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 scotland we and more people participate in it than i think some of the other sports which is much more of an individual one individual saying you know i'll become a snowboarder rather than any number of people participating you're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia, coming to you from London. I think I heard somebody on the closing ceremony talking about Britain perhaps becoming a superpower of winter <laughs> sports in the future. Is it simply the nature of winter games, the fact that specific facilities are required and there's not that much snow here? You know, winter sports is quite a rarity most of the time. Does that mean that Britain will never become a, a winter sports superpower, John Goodbye? Yeah, no, they will never become a superpower for the winter games um, simply because we're not a winter sports nation. It doesn't mean to say that... From time to time, as we saw 
in Sochi and we've seen in games over the years, you know, we're not going to have an outstanding group of people or an outstanding individual or a duo like Torv Lundin, for instance, in ice dancing, who um, who excel. Um, but we're not a winter sports nation and, you know, we're not uh, uh, Norway, Russia, the United States or even Germany. Interesting, though, that we actually finished in 19th place just behind Finland in 18th and ahead of Ukraine in 20th. They're probably more... Nations that are more synonymous with uh, with snow and winter sports. Maybe I'm being generalising here. Finland, given its uh, cold weather and, and winter facilities, doesn't do that well. I think the two things about uh, whether Britain can be a superpower. I think John is absolutely right. We should be cautious and realistic about wh- what can happen. But the other other factor is, and of course, to a certain extent, if you look at what's happening to the successors to Torval and Dreen, where are they? You know, they've suddenly, having been a major player in this, Britain has gone down. But the other factor that one should bear in mind is that other nations are coming up like some of the Asian nations Korea which is going to host the games uh, next time around China and Japan and there there is a lot of government investment certainly in China and Korea where they're determined to use the winter games to make if you like a wider political statement we don't have that sort of thing here you know you don't see Norwich hosting the Winter <laughs> Olympics in 20 so, years time so, wasn't. unless they create an artificial Norwich city somewhere you know <laughs> <laughs> do you agree Jonathan Wilson uh, do we have to be realistic about about our expectations with with regards to winter sports yeah absolutely i mean it's not just that we we don't have the snow and we don't have the mountains it's also we don't have the the century of sort of or two, 200 years of expertise beforehand of, of, of these things being competitive sports your yeah, football is obviously what I, what I know best and you can see a very clear correlation between population multiplied by gdp multiplied by experience in the sport tells you how good a nation's going to be near enough now we just don't have that experience. The Norwegians have been doing cross-country skiing forever. They're always going to be better than we are. I know they had a very bad Olympics this time, I recognise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think about the slightly strange entries that seem to be quite specific for for Winter Olympics? You've got the Jamaican bobsleigh team, of course, tie downhill skiing, Mexico's single competitor who's a, a German skier. Is that good for the Olympic ideal, John Goodbody? Yes, I, I, I think so. I think um, you know, it just widens the interest of the Games. I mean... My (laughs) quarrel with the Winter Games is that the IOC have insisted that uh, all the events should be on snow and ice. And what I think should happen in order to widen the appeal of the Winter Games is to have certain what are definitely winter sports, indoor sports, like boxing, table tennis, judo, wrestling, weightlifting, a selection of those moved across from the summer sports into the winter programme because a place like Sochi could quite easily have accommodated, I believe, two or three of those sports while the the outdoor sports are going on. And that, to me, would widen the appeal of the Winter Games. You know, the IOC have got a wonderful product, if you like it, in the Olympic Games. Instead of curtailing the whole time the number of sports that can take part, they want to boost up the Winter Games programme. So far, I've been unable to persuade the IOC to do this, but I'm ever hopeful. Is that partly because of maybe the winter, the summer games are always quite overburdened with the sports as well, or is that...? Yes, to a certain extent it is, but the, the object would be to increase the, the global interest in the winter games so that, say, with sports like boxing, African nations could take part in it. But I, but I think winter sports has always been a sport which have been played, for want of a better word, from either European countries or countries which are from Europe, like North America and so on. I mean, for instance, there's no African country there. You know, if you go to a winter sport, the number of non-European faces you see is quite striking, and that hasn't changed much. Some of the Asian countries are coming up, but again, India, for instance, didn't even march under its own flag, but that was because of the problems with the International Olympic Committee. It had one representative and things like that. So I think that is going to be... I take John's point about having some indoor sports and I remember some years ago, a bridge made a move to try and get into winter sports and saying, you know, bridge would be a very good winter sport now, you know. Yeah, one can argue that my wife would be very pleased because she likes playing bridge, but, you know, how many people would think of bridge as a, win- as a sport at all, let alone a winter sport? I think that's a much more difficult task. Uh, Thomas Bach, the ISC president, made much of the fact that a lot of people around the world would be watching television, but actually that I don't think makes an impact. Unless you, unless there are people in your, in your own country playing the sport, unless you have a tradition of of that sport in the country, watching it is... 